when you write something really cool for Ben, let me know. Oh, I think I've written some cool things for Ben. <laughs> well, send me a list. Send me a list. I will. I should send you the piece I wrote for Tim Paul. That's the one at my most, um, that's my most advanced work. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer, and this is episode 17. My guest for this episode is Pat Vandehei. Before we begin, I need to ask a favor. If you enjoy this podcast, would you please take a moment to go to iTunes and leave me a rating? This will help spread the word and bring the show to more listeners. Furthermore, I'm honored and delighted that you are listening to my podcast. If you find value from the show and want to help me with hosting costs, I've just launched a Patreon page. Patreon is an online service that allows people to support creators in their work. You can find mine at patreon.com backslash Mark J. Connor. Now on to the episode. Hi, Pat. Hi. So I, I was wondering if you could introduce yourself, tell the listeners what you're doing. Okay. I'm, uh, as you said, Pat Vanda. Hi. Uh, I am starting a new job this fall. I will be the director of bands at Portland State University. I've just left a position uh, that I've held for 14 years at George Fox University, where I was director of bands, kind of uh, jack of all trades. I did uh, all the music ed, the conducting, um, instrumental tech, uh, the orchestra, and the band. And it, the, George Fox is a small liberal arts Christian college of about 3,000 in the suburbs of Portland. And I'll be going with a, and we had a full time staff of four and a lot of adjuncts, and I'll be going to Portland State, which has full-time staff of 23. Um, I'm going from about 30 majors to 450, so it's a big step. So I know from your bio that you've been the past president of the Oregon, um, the Oregon Music Educators Association or the Band Masters Association? Both. I was the president of Oregon Band Directors Association and uh, past president of uh, OMEA. So can you tell me a little bit about how you originally got into music? Uh, started piano in third grade. Uh, I was in a I was in a uh, country school here in Oregon, and I there was no band in the grade school, so I started trombone lessons. And the fifth grade, because my parents were interested and engaged and wanted that for me. Um, then when I entered in middle school in seventh grade, I had my first beginning band experience, and uh, it went from there. I knew by the time I was an eighth grader what I wanted to do with my life, and it was music. Wow, really? Do you have a sense of why so young? It just connected. It was the one thing in my life uh, that just uh, it just resonated. Uh, I couldn't yeah. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Oh, I had like all young kids, I had a, a stint where I was going to be a professional football player, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> that dream died quickly. Yeah, it, it does for most of us. So I, I'm curious about that. So when you took piano lessons as a youngster and then you took trombone lessons, so what was the beginning band room like? Was that, were you ahead of the other students? I was, and I was in the beginning band for, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I think my director was also my trombone teacher. He just wanted to make sure I was ready. Um, he put me in the beginning band for one, let's say one nine, nine week period. And then I went immediately to the advanced band. It, in those days, it was beginning, middle, and advanced. And I leapfrogged over and was in the top band. And it took me by surprise, to be honest with you. But it was also a, a wonderful thing and a wonderful time. I, that that kind of sealed the deal. Here was something I was really good at. Um, so you you went to high school, played in the high school throughout the high school, I assume. Absolutely. And, and, and then where did you go to school beyond high school? Oh boy, Mark, this is a long story. I was on. My undergrad was, I was on a nine year track. <laughs> I, uh, I, um, left high school. I graduated from high school in 1971 and I enrolled in the University of Oregon, which is our kind of our flagship school here in, in Oregon. Sure. And, um, as a music head major, my trombone instructor and I did not get along. I lasted two, uh, two terms, dropped out, joined a rock and roll band and went on the road for two years. Playing trombone? Playing trombone, yes. I, it was, 
<clears throat> that was the era of Chicago Tower of Power and all those bands and Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And sure, yeah, I mean, for two years um, we played clubs in the Northwest, traveled around, and it was fun. Um, quit that after two years, went back to school at the local community college in Eugene, and uh, finished my second year. Uh, and then I matriculated at University of Washington in Seattle. And okay. um, I was putting myself, and this is an, I don't know if your listeners will think so, but it's an interesting story in that my father, when I dropped out of school to join a rock and roll band, said, if you do this, you will not get another dime from me. I'm totally opposed. And of course, being 17, 18 years old, I said, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And my father was a man true to his word. He never gave me another dime. So when I went up to Seattle, I'm, I had to put myself through school. So I, my whole time going to school, I worked as a janitor at nights and, uh, and worked and, and, and then took classes. So I did it slowly. It took a while. Sure. And I graduated in 1980 and got my first teaching job, uh, public school in Beaverton. Wow. That's a great story, Pat. I, I think the listeners will really like that, actually. It was a journey. It really was a journey. And, I, you know, and the whole time I studied, the whole time I studied trombone, uh, wherever I was at, whether Eugene or um, Seattle, I was, I was um, studying privately um, and playing. And in Seattle, in those days, it was, it was a pretty rich place to find, you know, even paying gigs as a trombonist. So I, I did a certain, you know, uh, for a college student, I did a reasonable amount of, of studio playing, um, subbing in, in community symphonies, that kind of thing, plus playing in the university ensembles. Sure, and you must have been versatile for, with the two years with the rock band, even though it wasn't at the highest level, it's still versatility. Yeah, and, and, and I, I played in all the jazz bands, and uh, in those days also, you know, back in the day, the Elks Club bands, dance bands, were really big, and you could, you could find a fair amount of playing in Seattle in particular in those days, so I did that. And so, was the what was the music education degree? Was you had a music edu- ed degree? Yes. What was the music ed degree like in those days at Seattle? Uh, at University of Washington? Yes. yes. Not great. Uh, I, I I can say it's much better now. They've mm-hmm. they've revamped the program. In my day, it wasn't it wasn't real strong. Um, but by the time I got there, I was advised. I had, when I quit the rock band, I went to Lane Community College, and, and the name Gene Aiken, some people will know that name. He, he's the guy, he was just starting his career. Gene went on to University of Northern Colorado and started the UNC Press, Jazz Press, and um, is a rather big name in the, in the jazz band circles, um, did, made a big impact. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, he was a Washington grad, and he pushed me that direction, and I knew nothing else. I loved Seattle, so I went there. Um, but the music ed program, I felt when I started teaching, not as well prepared as I might be. Sure. I, I think I can safely say that. We probably all feel that way. I think so. I, I mean, I think I went to a, a pretty average music ed program, but I still feel like I didn't know what I was doing when I first started. <laughs> yeah. What was your first job after college? The name of the school is Aloha High School here in Beaverton. Um, I... It was, I was fortunate in some ways. This was a, this, uh, in, in Oregon in those days, it was, uh, double A, triple A, and four A high schools. This was one of the largest schools in the state. <clears throat> it was reasonably new. It was less than 10 years old. And, um, I followed a guy who did a good job. He had, but it was one band. It was one 100 piece band. Um, and marching was very important. Um, I got the job. And this, also kind of interesting in that what I didn't know was the principal that was there at the time. He was an ex Marine, ex Marine drill sergeant. Um, and he eventually became the assistant superintendent in Beaverton, but he was a taskmaster and he was sent to this school because when the school opened in the sixties, I think 69. So I, I guess I have to backtrack. The school is 11 years old. Anyway, when opened in 69, and those were the days of the modular systems, if you remember, and, and, and education was very interesting. And so you might take, you might have a dozen options for an English credit, and, et cetera. And, and it was a very experiential time in, in public education. About three years before I got to Aloha, the discipline was out of control, and they brought in this guy to shape things up. Um, and he had a reputation. And the first guy who got offered the job uh, turned him down. The second guy that got offered the job said, give me the weekend to think about it. 
And um, the principal said, let me help you with your indecision. I withdraw the offer. And then I called that maybe an hour after that and said, well, how how'd the interview go? I want him to see where we're at. And he said, I've decided to go with youth. And so he gave me the job. So I, I it was my first teaching job in a very uh, plum setting, except for this guy. And so my first two year teaching, two years of teaching, it was rough because he gave me some grace that first year. But by the second year, he expected things to be ship shape and winning awards. And I wasn't. And uh, he took me into my into his office and read me the riot act. Just, just tore me to shreds. He didn't like the marching band mainly. And uh, the choir director called the union, and the union called me and said, you want to press charges? Because he had taken me into a room and chewed me out. And I was smart enough. I was old enough, fortunately. I was about 28 by that time. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to press charges because I'm a new teacher. And I don't, <laughs> I don't want to... I don't want to get on the bad side. I'll ride this one out. And I did. Yeah. And he only lasted three years. And then from then on, things got better. But man, those first two years were rough. Yeah. I, I many times wondered, am I in the right career? But I, I stuck it out and then things got much better very quickly. Yeah. How common do you think that is for a young teacher to be faced with an administrator? Such maybe not to that extreme, but an administrator who really makes their life miserable. When, when would they know when to sort of be, to do what you did and keep your mouth shut, write it out, or when to maybe move on? I don't know that, I don't know if they know. I know that in my music ed classes, I tell that story. Yeah. And say, you've got to be very, very careful those first three years. You know, until you get your feet on the ground and you just, you just mouth shut and do your job and don't cause waves because you get, you know, I think if I had done that, that would have, that would have set me on the wrong side of the administrative part of the career. And I, I just didn't want to do that. I'd be trouble. I'd be a troublemaker. Right. I just listened to um, someone talking about this, who's in music PR. And they talked about how something that you do as a musician, because we live in such a small world, it can cause ripples for your whole career that you don't even, you can't anticipate. That's exactly right. I, I think your decision about, about keeping quiet is very interesting. It's a hard one to make. Well, and I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't even, at that time, I didn't even know that a principal couldn't take you into a room and close the door <laughs> and scream at you. Yeah. I thought this was probably the norm. Um, I didn't even know I didn't deserve it. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I was, fortunately, I, I think the thing that saved me older, I started teaching when I was 27. And I was just old enough and I'd been through enough to, I had a sixth sense already to know, well, this is good, this is bad, and I better just keep my mouth shut and move forward. Sure, sure. And I was I was already establishing really good relationships with students, and the potential was huge in that school. I thought, I, I got to just stick this thing out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit more, or I want to talk about sort of what happened from there, because you started out with that situation where you had a, a maybe a problem with an administrator, and you ended up with such a great career. So w where did your path lead next? I think uh, there was a number of things. There was The foundation I had going into my first job, it wasn't from books or music ed classes or how to deal with the classroom. It was, um, a lot of it was innate musical training that came from my, my applied study through the years, especially at University of Washington. That was the one thing they gave me. I had a terrific trombone instructor. I did a lot of research work, a lot of chamber ensemble work, <clears throat> a lot of orchestral playing. And I think, I think my, my years of playing the trombone and playing in, in some wonderful groups under some wonderful people and with some wonderful training, that helped me a lot because I just, I, I fell back onto that training all the time, not on my conducting classes and not on my theory classes and not on my music ed classes. It was more my, my experience as a player. Um, that helped. And so I think my musical sense was good. The other part is I'm from a long line of teachers. My grandparents were teachers. My parents were teachers, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, just a whole bunch of teachers. And there's a, I learned so much growing up just osmosis, hearing dinner table talk about how to deal with kids and all that. I, I, I kind of, I hit the track running. Um, I knew how to deal with kids. Uh, I love kids. I tell my music ed kids, uh, first day, Hey, there's there's two things you have to you have to take your applied studies <laughs> seriously. You've got to learn to be a good musician. And the other thing, you have to love kids. 
if you don't love kids, you're in the wrong profession. Get out. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 I love kids. I care for kids and it's easy for me. I'm gifted that way. It's easy for me to relate with kids and to connect with kids. Mm-hmm. And so that started happening right off. And it was evident that it was happening. Kids started hanging out with me. They would come into my office and, and spend time. And you know the thing. You know how it is. Absolutely. The, the community, the band community happened right off, and I was thriving. That's what got me to it. The, the, the administrator was a nuisance. He was, it, was, uh, it was something that I saw, you know, if I can ride this thing out, I'll be fine. So, Pat, you're going to be starting um, new this year at Portland State, but could you tell me a little bit about Fox and your experience there? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say, to tell you about Fox, I have to get, I have to go back farther and talk about my high school career. I was 23 years in public education, and I had two different high schools, and I built those two, from the standards around here, one of the better programs in the Northwest. Um, we won the state band contest and that kind of thing. Uh, that's concert band. Because of my reputation, um, I was asked to apply for the job at George Fox because um, I do not have a DMA. Mm-hmm. I don't have a terminal degree. I've got a master's, and that's it. Um, so I got the, I, I applied, and I got the job at George Fox. Now, George Fox at the time was training. There were three music ed majors at the time. Um, and it was, I mean, the department head and I both started about the same time, and we looked at it and said, this is, this is educational malpractice. We gotta, we gotta fix this. So what I did at Fox was, um, my daughter went to University of Oklahoma, um, and Steve Paul was there at the time, and he was a friend of mine, because he'd come from University of Oregon. And I asked, Steve had gone, but I asked the music ed and Dr. Bill Wakefield, both of them, the music ed guy was, uh, Mike Ryber come out to, to Newburgh and uh, do a clinic, work with my bands, work with other bands. I did a, this festival clinic thing and um, help me construct a music ed program similar to Oklahoma's using their philosophies and their structure in a small school setting. Can we do that? And they said, absolutely. And we spent three days writing up a curriculum. And, um, and over the years, that thing has evolved and morphed. Um, I've seen where we can change it here, or, or this is not working, and all that. And it morphed into something I think is very special for a small school. I mean, I'm very, very proud of it. And we went from three music ed majors, and at our height, we had about 40. Um, and then budget cuts and cuts in scholarship, because it's a very expensive school and such, it it dwindled down to about 25. Still, it, it it's a strong program. The music ed program at George Fox is very strong. So with that said, as are the ensembles, by the way, um, they the, the ensembles at George Fox have played at the Northwest Regional MENC twice, the state MENC contest, our, our conference three times, the Western International Band Clinic conference. Um, I'm only saying that as, as you know, you've got to audition to get into those. And we were selected and featured in prime spots. It's good, good, good groups. So it's a reputation thing. Um, Back to Portland State. Mm-hmm. Um, I was approached this last fall by um, the head of the search committee. He said, "Can we go out to dinner and talk about um, people that might from the Northwest that might be a good fit here? Because the choir program and the orchestra program they're going great guns. We're gaining ground. Um, just really great things happening. The band program is stagnated. And there's problems. And um, so I, I went out to dinner. I gave him my my thoughts on this person, that person. And then he looked at me, he said, what about you? And I said, <laughs> I laughed at him. I said, you know how old I am? Well, I'm 64. Why would you hire me? And um, he said, because we need somebody to come in and heal the program. And you're the guy we want to have to do that. Um, again, it's a reputation thing of my connection with the Northwest, my connection with the professional groups, OMEA, et cetera. I know all the band directors. I've been in everybody's room working with their bands. We need somebody to come in that the, that the band, local band directors trust to to heal the program. Now, I'm again, I'm 64. I was thinking retirement at 66 at Fox. I was saying, okay, two more years, I'm good. But when he said, come in and heal and and make this, I thought that's cool. Mm-hmm. That's something I can get excited about. I can get excited about um, kind of my last hurrah yeah. in my career. Yeah. Um, and it's something. It's you know the music part will be there. You know, they'll be good ensembles. But more than that is being able to go in and put my handprint on a program and get it stable enough that they can do a national search and get 
some big dog to come in because it's a, it's a good situation. Portland's a wonderful place to live and they'll have no trouble filling that spot. Right now they might. Right now they might because the, the ensembles are actually smaller than my ensemble out of pot. Wow. So, but there's no reason for that. Well, that's perfect segue because I want to ask you a little bit about that at Fox. How do you approach that when you had, you said you had three music majors, which means how, how did you create a situation where other students wanted to come? That's really interesting to me. Um, well, it's a niche school, first of all. It's a Christian college, so it's a niche school. So a certain kind of kid that's going to go there, number one. But I think, I think what I was able to do, first of all, with the kids that were already there in the program that were undeclared, you know, and, and there were some kids that were performance majors, for instance. And, you know, they have no business being a performance major in a tiny little school like that. I shouldn't say that. That's not fair. You know, they, we, we would tell them, we're preparing you for grad school. Yeah. You know, go somewhere else in a bigger situation. So there are, we have had some kids go through and become very fine performers, but we knew that wasn't going to be the draw. We had to make music education very attractive. Um, and again, Mark, I, I, you know, and I'm, hmm, I've got to be careful that I don't sound arrogant here was my reputation as a music educator that band directors were willing to say, yeah, go there and study. Yeah. When I was a band director, I remember kids would come up to me and say, I'm thinking about this school, this school, this school. What do you think? And I say, ah, well, I mean, as a music edge, music education or performance major. And I say, ah, don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah. Take this school that I know that guy. He's good. And I think band directors have an enormous influence on kids and where they go to school. Yeah. If they're thinking about going to, to in music. And, uh, I think that's what happened. And then the, it just kind of caught hold. I think doing the regional conferences and playing and demonstrating to the directors that, yeah, we've got something really special happening here. I did, I started a festival at Fox, um, just a, uh, what we call a state qualifying festival for our state contest. Um, over two days and we'd have 30 bands coming in. We have a beautiful facility, a beautiful performing facility. So 30 bands are coming in over a two day period performing um come to our stage and we treated him well and that that was that was a big recruiting thing and i'd bring in big names like bill wakefield uh, gary green um tom lee guys like that for a clinic where i'd invite bands in and they'd pay a fee for a two and a half hour uh uh rehearsal with with whoever i had in so that was another way i got kids on campus and it just it just started to grow and we had a decent uh scholarship package that's also yeah. We had a decent scholarship package at the time. When they, they cut our scholarship in half, majors went down to, went down 50%. One of the best small schools I ever taught at was a really niche. It was only music therapy. They had two degrees. They had a music therapy degree and then a BA in music for the kids who bailed on music therapy. Okay. And that was it. Yeah. And they, they just had three faculty. Two of them were music therapists. One was a pianist. And boy, the students all work. Yeah. They did one thing really well and have a reputation for it. That's awesome. Yeah, I think so, too. I think so, too. You have to find your identity. Yeah, it, absolutely. And and then play to that identity. And we did, we said, we're, you know, we put out posters, music education at George Fox, make a difference, that kind of thing. And, and just that was our identity. And it worked. And we developed a very good. Oh, another thing we did was we had our, our CMENC, uh, CNAFME. Um, chapter was huge and we paid for the kids to go to the, the state conference there and we'd have 20 to 30 kids and they ran the conference um, and they weren't all music ed majors but we pushed it really hard and we they had t-shirts on we had our booth and all that they ran the booth and they did they were workhorses they just did I mean everywhere you turn you saw these blue shirts that said George Fox music and and whether it was working the 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 Honor groups are working the sessions. They were moving equipment, and they were, they didn't complain. They worked hard, and that, that that paid huge dividends. I'm not surprised. These are all really great ideas. Good. <laughs> we should get back to on track. <laughs> okay. All right. What's your process for reading a new work? So let's say you have two rehearsals, three rehearsals at either an honor band um, setting. How, how do you how do you accomplish that? That's a hard question because it depends on the kind of piece it is. But uh, for sure. for a generic piece, um, I do try to – well, I will talk through the roadmap and then try to read it straight down. Um, I mean, that's, that's just the way I do it. 
then go back, I mean, kind of a mac- macro to micro and start, and then start picking away at what I feel is the most uh, difficult sections and then go back and read it again. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, that's not sexy, but that's kind of just plow through. What hard-earned lessons have you about conducting and, and teaching would you like to share? Well, um, as conductors, we take ourselves too seriously. And uh, by that, I mean, I think we take the craft of conducting too seriously. And I'm not, I don't mean to demean it at all. I teach it and I believe in it and I work very hard at it. And um, I, I talk to my, my music ed kids and okay, gesture is, is all important and you've got to get all this down. Your gesture has to fit what the music says, but you better know what the music says. So preparation before you even get on the podium of what that score is all about and what, you know, listening, and listening and listening and listening and listening some more. If not the piece that you're going to do, then listen to pieces that are similar so you understand style. Um, and then I, I do timelines of the score, and I have the students do timelines of all the kind of like a Shanker analysis, only not that in depth uh, from a conducting standpoint of, of the roadmap per se, the important cadence points, the all the descriptors, all the time signatures, et cetera, all on a timeline on one page and, and helping the store, score study. Um, that's that's the kind of preparation that I do. Um, and I conduct through my rehearsals before every rehearsal every day um, as I learn as I learn my, my scores. Um, I was telling my wife last night, I'm doing a community band, and, and I, I'm doing the Gandolfi uh, Vientos tango, and it's hard. And it's hard to teach when you meet with a group once a week, even a, a good band, a good adult band. And I was I was pretty nervous going into it. And I told her, I said, and she goes, why are you nervous? You've done this kind of thing so much. I go, I am nervous and keyed up before every rehearsal I give. It doesn't matter what the rehearsal is or the level of the group. Mm-hmm. I'm nervous. Um, and mm-hmm. maybe nervous is the wrong word, but I am not relaxed until one minute into it. And then it, then because I've done it for so long, all the everything just kind of kicks in and it's automatic and I move forward. But so I do a lot of preparation. I just don't want to be caught unprepared on the podium. Um, yeah, and that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. I think that's really good advice and I think that's important. And I don't think being nervous before something is a bad thing. I think it's a sign that you care. Yeah, and when I say nervous, I don't. That does not affect my teaching. I, the kids would. I've said that to kids before, and they, they go, "What? You're kidding me!" You know, because I don't, I don't portray that nervousness. But I'm not, uh, not relaxed. I'm, I'm pretty keyed up when I, when I step into a room. Sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, have, do you have much experience with um, collaborating with composers and commissions? A little. Um, the latest one we just did. Uh, I worked with a guy. He was a, uh, he was my assistant at uh, the first high school I taught at. And he became my best friend. He was a percussionist, professional percussionist in the in the Portland area. Went on, got his music ed degree, and and was a teacher. So he was a colleague. And uh, he and his wife and two kids went to Zimbabwe to um, teach in an international school. And uh, he was an avid bicyclist, and he was out on a morning bicycle ride and got hit by a motorcycle and killed, um, uh-huh. died instantly. His name was Jeff, and and he was a beloved teacher in Oregon. So uh, Todd Zimmelman, who's another uh, name in Oregon that's that's pretty big, he he's got the best high school band in the area. He and I collaborated, and we went to Kevin Walzik, who's the composer, uh, composing teacher at at uh, in Monmouth at Western Oregon, and is very very good. It's a name you should know. And uh, we commissioned that work, and it was a it was a Oh, come on, collaborative thing with uh, several schools. What's that called? A uh, consortium. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Couldn't, the name was escaping. We had a consortium of schools doing that one, and uh, very effective. We premiered that work at the All Northwest Convention. Um, I did a, I did, I've done a consortium, a couple others as well, one with Dan Pham at Washington State, one with Tim Paul at the University of Oregon, and I think maybe one or two others, but that that's it. Um, with the with the Walzik piece, we had him come in and talk to the kids about the piece and um, idiosyncrasies, listen to a rehearsal, um, give advice. It was really, really effective. It was wonderful. Mm-hmm. What sort of value do you think that gives to kids 
when a when a composer's in the room with them? It's invaluable. And I'm ashamed to say I don't do it enough. They had a whole new understanding of both the piece and what it takes to put that piece together and to see a real life. See, uh, composers to kids, it's this mysterious thing. There's this guy out there or gal out there that does this. And, and magically somehow to have them come in and talk about the process is, is a great educational tool. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you give to your 20-year-old self, the young man who was in the rock band, um, going to be a music educator? Um, I think I would have taken much more care in the schools that I chose. If, if I could advise myself, I would say, really look into all your options. I tended to just take the advice of whoever was closest at hand and go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I thought many times about the track that I took. Um, and in some ways, I think it was awesome. It was wonderful because it was so eclectic, so eclectic musically, and it was so rich musically. I played a lot. And that part of it, I think, was really good, and in a variety of settings. From an education standpoint, I think I could have done a lot better. I think I could have been, you know, I, I, I think I could have gotten on the track. I think I could have gotten on the track to get a DMA, for instance. Mm-hmm. By the time, by the time, I didn't even know, I didn't even know the options. By the time I really thought about it and had somebody tell me, you know, you need to, you need to think about getting a DMA and, and, and do college. I, I had two young kids. Um, I, my wife was a stay at home mom. I had to earn the money to put them, you know, to, to keep things going. It just was not even an option. Sure. It just wasn't an option. Then at about 46, I really got serious about it. And then it was Tom Lee, actually, from UCLA. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 46. And he said, in a way, you're too old. Get on the track. The track is too long. Um, you know, you've got to go through all the steps. The income, you go and you've got to be in a small school and then be an assistant. And to get to where you want to be, you're 75 years old. And I said, oh, man. So I, I, I was very discouraged by it. So when George Fox came up, I grabbed it. I thought, okay, here's my opportunity. And it was. So at 20, I would, I would, I think I would have been a little more deliberate in tracking things out, in saying, okay, at this age I want to be here. At this age I want to be here. At this age I want to be here. Yeah. Um, could I, if I went back and I was 20 again, have done that? Probably not. But it's, you know, I'm answering the question the best I can. Yeah, sure. So, Pat, you've had a, a, a tremendous career. I, I'm curious about. What do you see the challenges facing the future of music ed? That's that is an excellent question as well. I say the challenges are unfortunately out of our control as music educators. In that you you have uh, I'll take my president at George Fox who reads the news and listens to the wrong people, and music education is dead. It's not being offered in the schools, and so really we don't need to be putting money into this because. There's no future in it anyway. And what I want to say to him, and I never have had the opportunity to say to him, is, yes, our culture is in flux now. Our culture, the, the dumbing down of America, if you will. Um, I, I have this conversation a lot. All right, I'm a Christian, and I'm a church musician. You know, I play a lot. Mm-hmm. And music in the church, and the church traditionally, if you look over the centuries, has been a leader in music. It's it's horrible. Yeah. The music you hear in churches is horrible. Choirs are dying. They just aren't even there. And, and you see that's, that is just, that's indicative of what I'm talking about, that the whole culture is changing into a pop oriented, a easy digestible sort of thing. And so the, the, people aren't taking it seriously like they used to. Mm-hmm. Now, what I would say to my president is all the more reason why we have to have music education. All the more, this is not the time to lay down and go, oh, things are bad. So this is the time we need to push forward and, and, um, you know, get the most dynamic people we possibly can in the classrooms to, to fight this thing. Um, and I think it's possible. I really do think it's possible. If it could turn bad, it could turn good again really quickly. And there's pockets all over the country where it's happening. There's pockets all over Oregon where it's happening, but too often it's, it's mediocrity. Um, and I think as music educators, I think we're part of the problem. There's, and when I talk about mediocrity, there are so many people out there that are doing, that have given up, that it's just a job and they go, it's an eight to five and they go in, they put in their time and they retire. 
Um, and that's, that, that's part of the problem as well. Yeah. As, uh, teachers of music education, we are not putting into place enough gates to weed out those that you can see. I can see a kid come in and, and they've got a target on their chest and they'll step up in the podium. There's no way. You've got to find ways to, to redirect those so they can be successful because they will not be successful in the classroom. And too often music education programs are factories and we need to get those kids in and get them out, put them in the, put them in classrooms. They get jobs, they fail and the program uh, eventually just dwindles away. We just see it happen all the time. Yeah. So is there other than gates, is there anything that, that you think that we can do beyond that? Can we do something with younger kids to sort of stimulate this desire, almost like the desire to sort of the calling, <laughs> I guess. I don't know what I'm trying to ask, but is there something we can well, do yeah, beyond? The, the hard thing is, Mark, I think is, again, it's our culture. We are so finance oriented, so money oriented. Um, parents go, you don't want to be a teacher. You don't want to be a music teacher. There's no future in that. You can make a lot more money doing whatever or be more secure. And so our best and brightest kids like probably the bassoon player in Tim's band. I don't know. I have no idea what he did. The best and brightest don't go into music education. They're scared. They're afraid of it or else they're being encouraged to not go. Um, I think as directors, high school directors in particular, uh, um, if you can, you can earmark those kids early and convince them if you're good yourself, you've got to set a really good example. So they see this is a cool thing to do. They, they, they love playing in the band or they wouldn't be there. Now, if, if you see a kid that is not only that, but has the personality, the mindset that they'd be a good high school director or middle school director, um, you need to earmark them and encourage them that this is a terrific career. That's, that's, I mean, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Um, and it worked. I, I have quite a few kids out there that are teaching now because of that. But I, I think I think I think the, the 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 key there though is you've got to be setting the example yourself. Yeah. You've got to be vibrant and excited, and um, showing through example that this is this is the best best career since you know whatever. It's yeah. awesome. It's why I asked you that question in the beginning because I, I think often it's a teacher who inspires us to go teach the same thing. No, no question. There's no question. I'm curious. I, I live in the Midwest. I moved to the Midwest um, after my doctorate from California, where it was very different. And the marching arts phenomena is huge right now in my part of the country. <laughs> yeah. What What do you think of it? And is it the same in Oregon? Yeah. Yes and no. Uh, we're on the decline um, and it, since the recession. Um, some of the programs shut down and it's never quite recovered. But yeah, I mean, we have a big, we have the Northwest marching circuit and um and i'm i'm a part of it i do a lot of judging um because when i was in high school as doing high school we had a competitive marching band and we did the whole the whole shtick and it's one of the things that started to burn me out yeah frankly when i was younger i thought this is cool i'm enjoying this but it's what a time drain it's a young man's gig it is and uh i just got so tired of it and um so yeah, another reason why I made the jump, I took a $17,000 pay cut to do small college, <laughs> to do higher ed. And, and one of the reasons was I said, I can't do this marching band thing anymore. Right. It's, just, it's killing me. I was going to say, especially when you're a, a one director school. I had a big staff that we'd hire out. And, and frankly, I tell, I tell my students, I mean, there's no marching band at Fox. And I tell them, don't avoid a big school because they have marching band. You know, we have a marching band unit and all there, but... I say, you know, it's, you're an administrator. You teach the music, you hire the show writer, you hire the song, the, someone to write the music book, you hire the color guard, the pageantry people, you hire a drum guy, and you have a parent group that raises thousands of dollars to put this all on the field. And I can argue both sides of it. I mean, from a community standpoint, it's a wonderful thing, but it does burn kids out too, especially those part, you know, you lose kids if you make it mandatory. There's students, there's schools around here that do that. You have to be in the marching band and you have the state champion bassoon player walking the halls. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's something wrong with that picture. I loved being in marching band, but I never loved marching band. If that makes sense. Yeah. It's a fun act. It's a, it's an activity. It's yeah, fun. But I wanted it's to fun. play my trumpet. That's what I was. That's what made me happy. 
Sure. Now, when I started teaching, it was halftime shows, and we would do a parade competition, which is much easier. There was a big parade competition at Oregon State University. We did that every year and and did a halftime show, a new halftime show, the old the old squad maneuver shows, you know, that were big. And, uh, and it was pretty easy. It was pretty simple. I didn't have extra rehearsals. We did it all during class time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the parents loved it. The kids loved it. The administration loved it. Everybody was happy, except for the school across town started in on this competitive marching band stuff. And I was too competitive and parents would come back and kids would come back and say, well, why don't we try doing something like that? That looks awfully cool. And <laughs> doggone, I opened the Pandora's box. <laughs> I stepped in and I was never able to turn back. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be really, really careful with that. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's a double edged sword, isn't it? Because it, it's providing interest from outside. It's bringing money and, and exposure, but it also does what you say. It can burn out. It can become too much. Well, it, I think I think it helps with numbers. I think it helps with numbers of kids in your program if you handle it right. Yeah. I don't think it does if you make it mandatory, but I think you can you can you can play that game. And and mine was it, it, we're not it's not mandatory, but it's highly expected. If you don't do it, then you have to you know you've got to audition for the All Northwest Band. You've got to do these different. I had these di- different little things they had to do videotaping themselves playing these different etudes and all that because I wasn't going to give them a free ride. Sure. But they didn't have to be in it. And so my numbers were pretty good. Yeah. I I also worry about if marching band is so competitive, then we make everything in music competitive as opposed to just having it be what it should be, which is about great art and making music. Well, and that opens up another thing. We have in, in Oregon a state band contest. Some states do. Many states don't. But, um, I mean, where they pick the number one symphonic band in the state of Oregon and they rank those top 20 bands that qualify to 20. It's brutal. And bands are, are trying to qualify all year long. And if they don't, it's a failure. Um, and so, you know, it's become, it's become that same kind of thing, a very competitive. The good news is it, it fights mediocrity. The quality of bands in the state of Oregon has risen astronomically since I started in 1980. Yeah, there are some terrific bands, and that's that's the reason why. So there's a there is a a a there's a philosophical reason to do the competitions. Unfortunately, it gets the best of us as human beings. We we are too competitive, and we place our value as a teacher on how many trophies that we won. Yeah, sure. So Pat, here's the question that trips up most of my guests: What's your favorite work for wind ensemble or band? The one I'm working on right at the time. Good answer. <laughs> I like that. I do a lot of, have done a lot of literature. Um, I, my favorite, I do a lot of different styles. What I tend, I, I always intended to be drawn towards is a beautiful phrase. Does the piece make a beautiful phrase? Um, and does it, does it stir me? And when a, when a piece of music does that, um, I, I, I think, I think as a, as a listener, I'm drawn to programmatic music. I just did, um, uh, Philip Sparks' Savannah Symphony this last, this last spring. And, and it's, it's got some beautiful, beautiful lines in it. And it tells a, a really compelling story about, you know, slavery in the South and all of that. And it, I just, I love that kind of thing. And it's epic. You know, it's a it's a 25 minute work, and so those types of things. I'm doing the I told you I'm doing the Gandalfi Tango right now, which which is just such a delightful piece of music. It's so much fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I have a a favorite. I'm doing I'm doing Alfred Reed's uh, rendition of Velia um, as well with his adult man. Oh, what gorgeous lines! Gorgeous, gorgeous. Writing and uh, I just, yeah, I don't know. I can really, I just dive into that kind of stuff. Sure, sure. How about this? How about if I rephrase it and say, what's the last piece you want to conduct on your last concert? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to get an answer from you, Pat. <laughs> um, okay. I think the piece that that moved me the most, and if I could do it again, and I had a band that could do it again. Be Meslanka's Fourth Symphony. All right, there you go. See, I knew you, I knew you had one. 
Yeah, and I was able to do it. Fox has this beautiful big um, auditorium with a full pipe organ in it. And Anka Sports Symphony calls for pipe organ, and uh, we we did the we did it in all its danger, and it was just it's spectacular. And I don't think I've ever I don't think I've ever been moved by a piece as I was conducting it as I was that one. So I would have since you make me make a choice, I would say that. But you know, will I have a band that can play that? I don't know. <laughs> David's such a a wonderful man, and his music's incredible. Oh yeah, I love it. I love it. All right. Is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Well, I'm in transition, so I don't have anything right now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 you know, just kind of watch Portland State and see if I can get this thing back on its feet and and do what they've asked of me, and then I'm going to fade into the sunset. No, oh, I'm sure you can do a great job. And I, I just over the course of our conversation, if I were a music educator in the state of Oregon and I had a student ask where to go, you would be at the top of the list right now. Oh, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. It's the, the, the profession is vital, and it's so important to me. Um, uh, and I've spent my whole career doing this, and I I believe in it passionately. I believe in, of course, music, but I believe in music education. And what when, when you touched on how do we get kids to do it? That's a that's a that's the puzzle. Um, but I I I I firmly believe that the attitude of well, it's not that important, or it's it's dying. We don't need to be doing. There's no jobs. Is is uh, blasphemy? I I just think it now's the time to pull out all the guns and all the stops and work our hardest to get the best people in there. It's always been the time, but I think it's never been more vital because you, you know you build a program it takes three to five years. It takes less than a year to kill it. Yeah, and, uh, you get bad people in, and they destroy a program just like that. Good people, the good per- it's the person on the podium. So you got to get those personalities in there that can do it. All right, Pat. So how can people get in touch with you? My new email is p v a n two at pdx dot edu, and that's the Portland State address. Yep. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate what you do and who you are. I thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, will we meet again, Mark? I sure hope so. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.